Dr. Shonali Chandra and I welcome you all to our YouTube channel Medicine Decoded. Uh, in this video, in the Back to Basics series, I bring to you Physiology of Thrombosis. Now this is important because before you start reading about, uh, you know, hard on clinical topics like deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary thromboembolism, the risk factors, the manifestations, the clinical diagnosis, the management, it is very, very important for us to brush up our understanding of the physiology of thrombosis. So let's get started and talk about this uh, Vercos triad of thrombosis, which consists of three things. The first and foremost is the endothelial injury. Now endothelium is the lining of the blood vessels. Whenever the lining of the blood vessels is injured, it triggers a cascade of events, which ultimately culminates in thrombus formation, right? And for that thrombus to form, the coagulation system of our body is active all right so whenever there is excess coagulation like hypercoagulability that will lead to excess thrombus formation isn't it so endothelial injury ultimately culminates in coagulation now moreover let's talk about abnormal blood flow patterns as well okay now normal blood flow pattern is laminar right that means that the plasma is circulating or is flowing around the periphery and the cellular components of the blood that is the wbc's the rbc's and the platelets they are all flowing in the middle so that way is what happens is that the flow of blood is laminar it is well maintained what happens is that the cellular components get little chance to interact with the endothelial lining now whenever this laminar pattern flow is disturbed it can lead to coagulation like for example you have turbulent blood flow if there is turbulent blood flow rushing of blood flow through the smaller vessels it can trigger endothelial injury endothelial injury in itself can trigger in the local area abnormal blood flow patterns right and stasis of blood flow slowing of blood flow that can also trigger hypercoagulability so we realize that the thrombosis in the body revolves around these three important aspects of endothelial injury abnormal blood flow patterns and hypercoagulability now we're going to talk about them one by one so let us first talk about uh, what happens at the site of endothelial injury so now let us understand here this is the diagrammatic representation of a blood vessel where vascular injury has happened so the endothelial lining is disrupted so we can label it here let's say this is the endothelial lining okay here endothelial lining uh, the blue colored here is showing the basement membrane of the endothelial lining then underneath the basement membrane we have the uh, connective tissue and the collagen layer so let me label it as collagen underneath that you have the smooth muscle layer right lining of the blood vessels and these are cells that are shown here in the blood circulation are the platelet right so immediately what happens at the site of endothelial injury here is that these endothelial cells at the site of endothelial injury release a factor which is called as endothelin. Now this endothelin what it does is triggers vasoconstriction. It acts on the nearby smooth muscle cells and it causes vasoconstriction right so it limits the blood flowing in that area because whenever there is injury you see the focus is on plugging that hole of injury and the focus is on reducing the blood loss from that site so there is local vasoconstriction and secondly what happens is that with endothelial injury you see the basement membrane underlying is exposed the underlying collagen layer is exposed and therefore what gets exposed to the circulating blood is the von Willebrand factor 
right now the platelets have got receptors for von Willebrand factor and they get attracted towards them and these platelets are then going to bind to these von Willebrand factor so what happens is platelet adhesion now when that happens that also triggers a conformational change in the platelets let's say that the platelets get excited they get activated so there is platelet activation and that promotes you know the platelets to now bind among themselves also so platelets are going to stack one on top of the other they are going to bind to each other as well just like forming a wall of bricks okay and this platelet activation is also going to trigger the release of mediators right the release of uh, substances from the platelet granules which are ADP and thromboxane A2 so these are released from the platelets now thromboxane A2 is in itself a very potent a very powerful uh, vasoconstrictor agent and these two agents also they are going to recruit more and more platelets into the area because the wall has to be built isn't it so they are going to cause recruitment of more and more platelets into the area to give rise to this wall which is called as the primary platelet plug so we get the formation of a platelet plug so for now the injury has been sealed but this is not a cemented wall this is only a stack of bricks laid on top of one another it needs further strength for that layer, layer of cement has to be laid down now what happens is the coagulation system comes into play so let's talk about that also what happens is that a factor is released which is called as the tissue factor now this tissue factor is going to act as a procoagulant that means it is going to initiate the coagulation cascade right now this procoagulant factor is expressed you know uh, in the underlying uh, tissues here which get exposed only when there is endothelial injury so this is a membrane bound procoagulant factor which is expressed in the smooth muscle cells in the underlying fibroblast cells of the collagen layer so it gets exposed only on endothelial injury so we realize one very important fact that our body's first line of defense against thrombosis is a healthy intact endothelium so now activation of the coagulation cascade is going to ultimately culminate in thrombin formation the thrombin is going to convert the fibrinogen which is a soluble coagulation factor in the blood to an insoluble fibrin right this is insoluble fibrin clot and it is this fibrin which is going to provide the necessary cementing to our platelet plug and the strength to our wall of platelets so now the platelet plug has become more strong it has also become cemented because of the formation of thrombin and fibrin but also understand that yes in our body when injury is getting repaired and healed we do not want this thrombosis to extend to sites other than the site of injury or not to extend beyond the site of injury for that a counter system has to be put into place isn't it now endothelial cells the surrounding normal healthy endothelial cells are going to help in that process so what happens here is that these surrounding endothelial cells let's say here they are going to express a molecule which is called as 
thrombo modulin and this thrombo modulin is going to inhibit the coagulation cascade right so this coagulation cascade was causing formation of thrombin and fibrin now that has to be inhibited it has it needs to be brought in check and that is done by thrombomodulin again expressed by the normal healthy nearby endothelial cell now these nearby endothelial cells are also going to express another molecule which is tissue plasminogen activator tpa now we have plasminogen here let's say we have plasminogen here plasminogen under the influence of tissue plasminogen activator it gets converted into active plasmin okay let's say this is active plasmin now the shape has changed it has become active so we realize as we see here that this tissue plasminogen activator converts plasminogen to active plasmin now this plasmin is going to cause lysis of fibrin break down fibrin so excess fibrin will not be allowed to collect now this process is what we call as fibrinolysis fibrinolysis so you need to understand this basic physiological mechanism to make sense of how our body responds to endothelial injury all right like for example you can also understand here that disorders of the coagulation cascade where they become active without any uh, intervening stimulus will lead to thrombin formation you can understand that disorders of fibrinolysis can also lead to excess clot formation you can understand that how this physiological concept is used for a therapeutic advantage we have agents which are going to utilize this knowledge of fibrinolysis so that we have fibrinolytic agents we have synthetic tissue plasminogen activators which are available which work by the same principle so you need to have a focused understanding of this very basic principle another important principle that you need to keep in mind look at this pathway and understand whenever there is excess thrombosis excess thrombosis will also trigger excess of fibrinolytic activity ultimately there is going to be breakdown of fibrin into fibrin degradation product that happens naturally normally also but whenever there is excess thrombosis excess fibrinolysis is triggered and excess fibrin degradation products can be detected in the blood stream so when you do the blood tests when you want to check for excess thrombosis in the body one can also check for excess fibrin degradation products like you do when you check for disseminated intravascular coagulation you check the values of d dimer as well as fibrin degradation products and that can be helpful now let us see how it all ends in our body now let's see here ultimately we will understand here that thrombin is our very very important molecule which we get from the coagulation cascade thrombin itself is going to lead to more platelet aggregation in the area of injury thrombin itself is going to lead to clot formation so ultimately thrombin is required for sealing the site of the injury for good once and for all but yes it is the same thrombin which is also going to trigger you know neutrophil adhesion right which are going to further you know cement the clot right rbcs are also trapped in this clot right and ultimately this clot needs to be digested and heal it will not be staying like this angiogenesis and repair also has to follow 
thrombin is the same molecule that is going to trigger it all for us right so neutrophil adhesion and you know monocyte activation the repair cells are triggered into action the lymphocyte activation the repair cells of our body the white blood cells are triggered into action and ultimately angiogenesis and repair of this injured vessel will take place so now we understand that coagulation factor and the anticoagulation factors in our body are maintaining a balance isn't it so we realize that the prothrombotic factors and the antithrombotic factors that are released from the endothelium are in a balance and similarly there are two distinct pathways we have the coagulation pathway and we have the fibrinolysis pathway which are maintaining a balance with each other so let's now focus more on the coagulation pathway to understand the second aspect of thrombosis which is hypercoagulability so let's see what happens how in our body coagulation happens in vivo so we're talking about in vivo clotting cascade we told you that it begins with the release of tissue factor from the site of endothelial injury which activates factor 7 into 7a and forms a complex with tissue factor now uh, this is a pathway that has already been outlined for you what you need to remember are the three principles you need to remember two important things that this is a dance of coagulation the clotting factors are like dancing among with each other they are exchanging partners ultimately leading to formation of thrombin and the dance floor for this dance is actually the platelets the surface of the platelets right the phospholipid surface of the platelets it is the dance floor so platelets are also playing a key role not just in the formation of the wall that we talked about not just in the formation of the platelet plug but also in providing the floor or framework over which the dance of coagulation is going to take place right so platelets play a very very important role here as well keep that in mind so we get the activated factor 7 and tissue factor complex which further activates factor 9 into factor 9a and then factor 9a complexes with factor 8 to ultimately lead to activation of factor 10 and factor 10 complexes with activated factor 5 ultimately converting thrombi, prothrombin to thrombin and we've already talked about this. So, I'll highlight the very, very important aspects for you. I'll, I'll highlight the importance of this factor, factor 7A and tissue factor. Very, very important complex causing initiation of the coagulation cascade. I'll highlight two other important factors which are needed, activated factor 8A and 5A which are needed to push the coagulation cascade forward and also realize now here that there can be sometimes mutations in our body inherited mutations which can lead to excess prothrombin so if there is excess prothrombin here certain kind of mutations which can lead to excess of prothrombin then there will be hypercoagulability in that individual okay a tendency for excess clotting whenever clotting might be initiated or whenever factors which are going to lead to clotting maybe endothelial injury or maybe or, or abnormal blood flow patterns these individuals will then have more uh, you know degree of clotting than their normal counterparts right now let us understand the next aspect as to how is the coagulation limited to the site of uh, injury only now let's go through this one by one and highlight the important aspects so these are heparin like molecules 
these are this one here and this one here i'll just label it here these are heparin like molecules which are in the circulation they are also expressed by normal endothelial cells okay and there is a factor in the blood which is called as antithrombin 3 okay so at3 right now this antithrombin 3 is a natural anticoagulant because this antithrombin 3 can bind with this heparin like molecule and once that happens this antithrombin 3 and heparin like molecule complex together can bind to this thrombin see this is the thrombin molecule here which is our central molecule triggering the formation of fibrin causing platelet aggregation and also at the same time leading to angiogenesis and repair but we do not want excess of thrombin excess of thrombin means excess of coagulation so what will happen is that this antithrombin 3 and heparin like molecule complex can bind to thrombin molecule and inactivate it isn't it so what we see here that this antithrombin 3 and heparin complex is going to inactivate thrombin and not just thrombin it also inactivates other activated factors of the coagulation cascade like factor 9a factor 10a factor 11 and 12 as well so what we realize here is that this important physiological information has been used to determine the utility of heparin like molecules the synthetic heparin in inhibiting coagulation isn't it so this is where the heparin has got its uh, you know um, pharmacological role from so keep this in mind also keep in mind here that there are other molecules which are also taking part in limitation of coagulation not just antithrombin 3 now there is also this another molecule which is tissue factor pathway inhibitor expressed by the healthy endothelial cells nearby. So I had highlighted to you the important steps of the coagulation cascade. Here tissue factor pathway initiation factor activated factor 7 in tissue factor complex and then factor 5 and factor 8 playing very crucial roles in in vivo clotting cascade now let us see how our body tackles this so we have this tissue factor pathway inhibitor which is going to inhibit this tissue factor and activated factor 7a complex going to act there okay and then we have another molecule here which is expressed by the endothelial cells nearby healthy endothelial cells nearby and that is thrombomodulin now this thrombomodulin is going to stimulate the binding of thrombin here that is one thing that it does so it inactivates thrombin therefore by binding it and secondly now this complex is going to stimulate the production of activated protein C from protein C okay now activated protein C in the presence of protein S is going to cause inhibition or inactivation of activated factor 5 and activated factor 8. So in our body we have naturally circulating anticoagulant factors as well 
right and this balance between thrombin formation and anticoagulation is maintained by the body right so we have this naturally occurring anticoagulant factors which are protein s and protein c now when you can understand this pathway it will be clear to you how are inherited thrombophilias manifesting themselves depending upon what factors mutation are present so one thing that i told you in the previous slide was that there is a mutation which affects uh, when there is uh, excess of prothrombin formation there can be a mutation affecting the antithrombin 3 Uh, gene and we can have antithrombin three deficiency, right? Because antithrombin three is anticoagulant factor, so we can have mutation in antithrombin three causing antithrombin three deficiency, right? This is the most thrombogenic of inherited mutations, right? We can have deficiencies of protein c and protein s one of that mutation is what we call as factor 5 laden mutation we call it as factor 5 laden mutation now what happens in factor 5 laden mutation it there is a mutation in this factor 5 which makes it resistant to the action of activated protein c so it is also called as uh, activated protein c resistance so there is another factor 5 laden mutation this is the most common type of inherited thrombophilia right which is factor 5 laden mutation there can be deficiencies of protein c there can be deficiencies of protein s as well so there can be a number of inherited mutations which can give rise to coagulation disorders right to make sense of them this physiological aspect of thrombosis needs to be clear to you it needs to be clear that the body maintains a balance between the anticoagulant and the procoagulant factors okay and also to summarize do not forget the role of normal intact endothelium so it is the first life or first line of defense against thrombosis whenever there is endothelial injury that triggers the coagulation cascade and normal endothelial cells nearby they are providing a very vital role in maintaining this balance by exhibiting heparin like molecules by exhibiting tissue factor pathway inhibitor by also exhibiting other important substances like nitric oxide and pgi2 that is prostar cyclins right and these substances which are released from the healthy nearby endothelial cells these are potent platelet aggregator inhibitors and also vasodilator agents so look it began with vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation and it will ultimately end with vasodilation and inhibition of platelet aggregation platelets have a very very important role to play in this thrombus formation and the coagulation cascade now we don't want excess platelets to be recruited into the area so that needs to halt and that is also brought about by further release of prostacyclin and nitric oxide right so keep this important information in mind right so you have your prostacyclins and nitric oxide which are improving the blood flow in the region of the injury they're going to restore they're going to cause vasodilation blood flow is going to get restored once blood flow is going to re get restored it is also going to cause wash away of the coagulation factors which are actually circulating in the area wash away of the uh, platelets which are circulating in that area so that balance is always going to be maintained until and unless 
there is some or the other disturbance so coming back to our triad vercos triad of thrombosis where we are seeing that this balance gets disturbed whenever one or the other things predominate let's say for example there is excess endothelial injury which can trigger this thrombosis and that injury goes beyond repair or the injury is a continuous phenomena in the body so we can have any physical injury we can have any physical injury which can trigger endothelial injury we can have states of infection and inflammation in the body which can trigger endothelial injury we can have increased cholesterol in our body we can have atherosclerosis of the blood vessels which can trigger endothelial injury smoking can trigger endothelial injury right hypertension a very very important risk factor hypertension can cause turbulent blood flow and then trigger endothelial injury right and again injuries like uh, you know um, burns trauma surgical injury anything of this sort can also trigger endothelial injury so you have this whole set of risk factors which are triggering endothelial injury in the body and therefore proving a risk factor for thrombus formation in the body we can have disseminated cancers we can have disseminated cancers right in which procoagulant factors are expressed in those disseminated cancer state and can lead to hypercoagulability we can have pregnant females pregnancy is a state of excess of coagulation factors hypercoagulability right we can have factors which are also contributing to stasis right like for example burns trauma surgery bedridden states right bedridden states immobility stasis hyperviscosity of the blood polycythemias and n number of causes of polycythemias stasis sickle cell anemia disorder sickle cell anemia leading to slowing of circulation in the microcirculations right so sickle cell disease you have to keep in mind the principles and then all the risk factors will make sense to you abnormal blood flow patterns and stasis can also be seen in congestive heart failure states stasis right so whenever there is stasis there is more likely chances of venous thrombosis of venous thrombosis even in pregnancy you see there is also uh, a component of stasis in place in pregnancy as well as hypercoagulability making pregnancy a risk uh, a high a, a riskier proposition for venous thrombosis and we'll talk about that in detail that's a whole different topic for other lecture and on the other hand endothelial injury like events like hypertension associated or infection inflammation associated atherosclerosis related smoking related so where endothelial injury is the primary modality of uh, thrombus formation it more often leads to arterial thrombosis right in fact uh, turbulent blood flow patterns will also lead to more likely uh, arterial uh, thrombosis so remember this uh, this triad once you remember the triad once you understand the physiological basis of thrombosis now you can understand 
that these are the high risk situations where there is a risk for thrombosis in the body and from here begins your clinical journey and intervention identification of risk situations and once you know the basics of thrombosis you can understand why in certain situations which kind of therapeutic interventions will work in which kind of thrombotic disturbances